Uh, we are so excited to be here today to talk to you about using Justice Server and Salesforce for cloud-based client management. Uh, next, you get to see our smiling faces at you. Um, Brian wins the award for the coolest picture. Um, if my name or my face happens to look familiar to you, that is because um, I got my start in legal and technology with ABA Free Legal Answers. So um, if your state happens to use that site, uh, you may have seen me present or, or speak on that topic a few times at legal service conferences or um, even on a webinar. So I'm so happy to be with TechBridge right now, and I'll take this time to tell you a little bit about te what TechBridge does next. So TechBridge is actually um, a nonprofit, and one of the, oh, you know what, that's a good idea. Before we even jump into that, let's talk about our webinar takeaways to today. So first we're going to talk about understanding the key benefits and advantages of Salesforce.com as a platform. Um, I'm curious and I'm not sure how polling works, but I'd love to know how many of you have heard of it or have uh, heard of the nonprofit success pack, one of the, the greatest interventions in technology for nonprofits, in my personal opinion. We'll also focus on insight into Justice Server for case management. It is a um, application that we built on top of Salesforce nonprofit success pack. I uh, want we'll, to we'll give you an overview of how its volunteer portal can actually help you grow your pro bono attorney involvement because we know everyone wants everything uh, digital, right? And then uh, we want to hear from Brian about the Volunteer Legal Services Project and how they've been able to use that platform, not only for data management, but for also uh, the way that they work with their volunteer attorney portal. Um, now, how about we hear a little bit more about TechBridge now that you know why we're here today. So TechBridge is a nonprofit serving nonprofit. If you have any business experience, uh, you might have heard the phrase B2B, business to business. Well, we're actually uh, end to end, um, nonprofit to nonprofit. And the short phrase I like to use to describe what we do is uh, we help other nonprofits do good better. Um, it's as simple as that. You guys um, are out there on the front lines making change happen for the most vulnerable populations. And we want you all to be able to use technology to do that for you um, as easily as possible and to help make a bigger impact from that. So um, next I'd like to talk about how we think that um, technology can actually transform nonprofits. Oh, you know what? I'm uh, looking at something a little bit different than Rick is looking at here. So I'll go ahead and jump into this one. It is uh, what we deliver, and what we deliver are uh, strategies and solutions to uh, help nonprofits, as I just mentioned, uh, be more impactful. Our kind of route with that impact is that we offer these services that you're seeing on the screen here to help do outreach, and we know to do outreach, that leads to getting intake, and that's the unit intake of the client. Then you're serving, so how can technology help you serve uh, clients more effectively, more efficiently? Um, from that service, you know, you're, you're actually doing a performance, right? So when you think about that performance, uh, how can you use technology either to make it easier or um, to demonstrate those outcomes that you've done to help other groups scale it? And we know that's huge in the legal services uh, arena where uh, LSC, for example, always wants to know is something you've done replicable. Well, to know that something's um, replicable or has uh, important outcomes, you have to be able to measure that performance. And then when you can talk about how amazing the services that you're offering and the impact you're making, you can then use that information to fundraise. So when you have an executive director, <clears throat> excuse me, or a um, development director coming to you and saying, how many cases did you win? What was that economic impact? They're turning around and taking that information to fundraise. And we think that technology has a route to help nonprofits be more impactful for th through that. So you see on the screen here, effective outcomes require streamlined and automated operations with the ability to share and analyze data from across the organization. And I want to challenge that and push it further to say that systemic change requires the ability to share and analyze data from multiple organizations to determine necessary services for escaping poverty. And by that, I mean, we're not gonna see uh, changes in the things that lead people to uh, being vulnerable, um, things like uh, eviction or uh, loss of a job, et cetera, until we start uh, analyzing what the things are at that base population level that lead to these items. And once we do, we think that using this route that you're seeing on the screen, 
we can then start to make systemic change targeting um, rather than one population with one specific need, uh, say uh, people who are in need of housing, but rather we can start uh, doing population level change to say in this community by offering these services as nonprofits, we can help uh, people take building blocks out of poverty. All right, um, like to keep going and talk a little bit more. Gonna wait for the screen to catch up with me. There we go. Um, about specifically how we're able to use Justice Server to help um, legal nonprofits do that. And um, before uh, I hand it right over to Brian to tell us specifically about how uh, his volunteer legal services project in Burbank County did that, I just want to mention that um, besides the items I mentioned about hoping to do systemic change, um, we'd love to also make sure that uh, nonprofits are ready to do um, operational readiness. And what I mean by that is that we want nonprofits not only to be able to sustain their own operations, but we want them to use technology to help grow and to help innovate. And we think that uh, what we were able to do for Brian in the Volunteer Legal Services Project is a perfect example of that. So, Brian, you wanna take it away? Absolutely. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Brian Babcock and I am the Technology Director here at Volunteer Legal Services. I am going to talk a bit about our agency and then later on in the presentation, I will be showing you our actual uh, instance of Salesforce and walking you through some of the awesome things that it does. So uh, our organization is here in Rochester. We are the pro bono agency in the area and we do only pro bono uh, cases. Uh, we have a panel of about 1,600 attorneys uh, that we push cases out to um, and it's uh, you know incredibly 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 robust. So um, we we exist um, in a co-located building with other legal service providers. Uh, it's kind of a unique model here in the area. Um, we engaged with TechBridge uh, three or four years ago. Um, when Rick talks, he may have the actual date. Uh, we were using a system called Time that I know probably some of you listening have either heard of or know agencies that have used it. And we were also using another database for all of our donor management. We wanted a database that was going to be able to be our case management system, be our volunteer management system, and be our donor database as well. Uh, many of our pro bono attorneys are also our donors, so we wanted to be able to um, see all of their information in, in one consolidated database. And uh, after a great deal of um, time and thought put into migration, we did successfully migrate into Salesforce, and we have integrated it into our um, Google Docs and Google Calendar and email systems. So um, it's... it's and more than just the integration of those multiple databases that we had, um, but it's now integrated into most of our workflow. Um, so a few outcomes that we've got here. Um, you can see on the screen, I hope, that we had a little over 4,000 individuals benefit from our um, legal representation that we offered. Uh, we have a breakdown there of the extended represent representation outcomes. Um, ten over 10,000 people benefited in the last fiscal year. Um, this is uh, some great information that I know uh, some of you would be interested in. What we're able to do here at VLSP with we have a staff of uh, about 15 full-time people, uh, and uh, you know everything else comes from our pro bono um, volunteers and. Over 6,000 hours were donated last fiscal year. So it's, um, uh, you know, that's all being tracked through our system. Uh, much of it now is being tracked automatically with the uh, attorneys that are signed up on our pro bono portal, which we will show and talk about shortly. So, a quick question um, What was the uh, 
transfer cost moving over from those different systems um, into this one unified system? Ah, sure. So, um, you know, total total cost, I think, would be difficult. Probably something that we um, we could get some numbers from TechBridge. But one of the greatest things about um, Salesforce as a platform is that if you are a nonprofit, Salesforce offers you ten free licenses. Um, so, using the Salesforce platform with the nonprofit starter pack or and they may have a different name for that now, um, is, um, is completely free for your first 10 licenses. And additional licenses uh, come at an 80% discount. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure on the specific price of that now, but I'm sure Rick will be able to um, give us that information. And it's um, it, the robustness of the database platform is, um, I mean, it's supported uh, worldwide and so the the resources uh, both help resources but also apps that are written to go on go on top of the platform and integrations are just countless so um, the the fact that the salesforce uh, salesforce.org is providing that as a donation to 501c3s is, is a huge benefit of this and was one of the deciding factors in us switching to this platform um, because we had such limited funding Uh, a few of the uh, challenges here that we were looking to um, overcome, I think I may have spoken about some of this, but um, producing reports and, and having the ability to uh, have our staff attorneys and paralegals have at-a-glance reports uh, and up-to-date information was something that was um, really needed in the organization and has, since we've been able to do it, changed a lot of our workflows. Um, with the um, let's see, we had very limited limited ability to customize the the nice thing about this widely used database platform is it's extremely customizable, and this is kind of a plus and minus. I've heard of feedback from a lot of people that you know if if you don't have somebody on staff that um, can become familiar with customizing. Um, that might be, um, you know, kind of a, a, a detriment. Uh, however, Salesforce has so many guides and walkthroughs and uh, information online that uh, getting somebody on staff to become your on your on team expert uh, is becoming easier and easier uh, as the platform setup and customizations become easier and easier to use. So. Um, yeah, the, the integration into external systems is is uh, really second to none. Um, some some of the things that we're we've been able to do are completely unexpected uh, and just kind of came about as a result of hey, I wonder if we could do this, and somebody googles it and finds out hey, yeah, so you can do that with Salesforce. So um, we have a lot of automated processes happening. So it's um, uh, we've been able to overcome a lot of our challenges that way. We can go to the next uh, slide here. There we go. All right. I'll turn it over to Rick. Okay. There we go. Um, so I just want to go through uh, an overview before we jump in about uh, what Justice Server is and, uh, and what it can do. Um, so first, just to kind of clarify what you know, Justice Server versus Salesforce, we're talking about both. Um, you can think of Salesforce as a platform, and um, we, we've built Justice Server as an app, so it does a lot of things out of the box for uh, legal case management um, that can be installed, and then it can be customized on top of that. Um, so the things that, that Brian talked about, um, you know, you can, you can do that on top of the Salesforce platform. We've also got a lot built into uh, the Justice Server specific items that are are very customizable and, and flexible. Uh, just kind of a, an overview of the, the architecture. So you have Salesforce itself as uh, the core with, with Justice Server. So you do your case management within Salesforce. Your staff would live within Salesforce. Um, optionally, we can do online web forms for intake. And sometimes that is um, like an initial client inquiry where they're going to submit um, 
a request and then somebody can follow up with them or those forms have also been used like on site at a clinic for uh, intake somebody shows up you hand them an ipad they they get started on filling certain information out that can go directly into the system um, so you're you're producing those client cases in salesforce and those can then be pushed out we have a uh, a portal component as well for engaging pro bono uh, attorneys. And so these cases can be pushed out to this central portal. Um, and what we've tried to do is create something that encourages um, collaboration and um, cross organization. So this is really a, a nationwide portal that uh, within you know, your area, if there are multiple organizations, you could have volunteers that are taking cases from multiple organizations. Their single point of entrance is that central portal. Uh, so the, the attorneys create their account there. Um, there is an approval, so they can't just, um, you know, if they request to work with your organization, you, know, you get to see who they are and approve them before they can do that. Um, then, if they're going to get to the details of a case, they're going to be redirected through single sign-on. Um, so from the attorney's perspective, they don't really realize it's happening, but they're moving from that central portal to a local uh, portal that has direct access to your Salesforce instance. So there's a separation there between all the case details. It's only the very high level information that ever hits that central portal. Um, so that is both for security as well as um, real-time updates. So there's not like a, a sync of data that has to happen once they get to the local portal. If they add notes, if they change things, or your staff do, uh, everybody sees in real time what's happening there. Uh, and then there's all sorts of plugins that can be added on top of that. So you, you know, if you use Mailchimp or something, you you know you can have that feed out of Salesforce. You can do electronic signature with DocuSign. You can generate uh, templates with Conga Composer. There's all of these things out there on the App Exchange that can be plugged in to work on top of this and to extend your platform. Um, some background about uh, Justice Server. Um, so at the, at the beginning, um, it kind of came out of several separate solutions. So in Virginia, there were three legal service organizations that um, had, uh, that's where the name Justice Server came from. They had collaborated together and they were in one Salesforce instances. They had a lot of challenges and, and weren't quite reaching the vision that they had originally um, hoped for. At the same time, TechBridge had worked with a number of organizations building custom solutions on Salesforce. We then worked with uh, Brian, a couple other organizations to kind of compare notes and create something. And, and uh, we all kind of converged together to take the best of, create an app out of that that could be installed. Uh, funding for that came from, um, from LSC, from the uh, local organizations. There was a Salesforce grant. Um, TechBridge helped fund. So that there's many sources that uh, contributed to this, to, to what we have now. Um, and we continue to improve this. So um, you know, TechBridge, we are a nonprofit as well, and our mission is to serve other nonprofits. So, um, you know, when we have a, a project that somebody has an idea to improve Justice Server, and we can build that out and then return that back to the community uh, where, you know, we just have to cover our time and that's subsidized by our, our rates. Um, so there's not any um, license fees that we're charging on top of uh, Salesforce to, uh, to use Justice Server. Some of the key functionality that's included, um, client intake, uh, eligibility, there's various wizards and things to step through, your, your income, your uh, citizenship, uh, doing conflict check, handling referrals, uh, the case management components, so the, you know, all the things that you would expect around case notes and everything, managing households and problem codes, uh, your outcomes, tracking time, uh, tying back to, to grants and funding codes. Uh, and we also have a clinic component. So um, you can set up clinics to do scheduling. Um, this ties in with the portal as well so that volunteers could find shifts and sign up and get reminders and things like that. Um, 
the, the volunteer attorney portal that handles their registration, they can search cases, uh, they can do their conflict check. Um, there's some functionality for specifically for pro bono coordinators. So if you work with organizations that um, a pro bono coordinator goes and selects cases and then redistributes them to their attorneys, uh, it can handle that. Uh, you know, they have their case management functions and their clinic functions. Um, some of the reasons why to use Justice Server, you know, we've already mentioned some of these um, benefits about the Salesforce platform. Uh, you know, we worked with a lot of LSC organizations to, to meet the requirements of, um, of an LSC organization. Um, there's the discounts of Salesforce. Um, down towards the bottom, so one of the big things that we we see is the, the reporting. So you can build your own reports without having to go to a developer um, and pull the data out. So, you know, you, you bring everything together, the no data silos we mentioned there as well. You can do things like, you know, track donors, volunteers, clients all in one place. So I could target maybe um, attorneys who have volunteered their time, but they've never given money or, or keep track of those who have done both things, things like that. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass presenter to Brian so he can show you a bit of their Salesforce instance. Great, all right. Now, this is really cool. This is something I'm excited to show off because it's not often you get to actually see someone's actual instance. Usually you're looking at a um, uh, demo data. This is real live data, no client information, though you will see some attorney info, which we have permission to use. So, Hopefully you can see my screen here. Can everybody see that? Definitely. All right. So this is our, our main dashboard here. And what we have is a is kind of an always up to date uh, system that shows uh, people at a glance um, intakes. Uh, we have this integrated with an intake system. So uh, people can go to our website, do an online intake. They're automatically um, forwarded on to our intake staff and all of the data is um, sent uh, directly to this dashboard as well so people can kind of get an eyeball on where they're at. We're able to see, you know, cases that are referred for the month, cases that are referred for the fiscal year, our stale cases, um, cases that have been open a long time, our current pro bono hours. Uh, this is all information uh, that is mostly uh, created for the purpose of grant reporting. So um, it's kind of an ever-changing um, landscape of what our funders need, who our funders are. So, um, and it also helps us track any sort of uh, missing data. So um, we have a lot of processes running in the background that will alert our staff as to, oh, you forgot to fill in this field. Uh, we try to keep our data really clean. So um, there's there's a lot of a lot of things you can do to make that happen as well. Um, and and we have a number of dashboards. So this is our main one. Uh, I wanted to show off a little bit our pro bono portal dashboard, which um, will show us. Um, all of the current available cases, um, the cases that are all currently assigned. So uh, right now we have 36 cases being worked on uh, simultaneously on the pro bono portal, and that number changes probably uh, by the hour on weekdays. Um, the available cases is actually public, uh, actually may not be, I better not go into that one, uh, information. Uh, so clicking on any of these will bring you into um, uh, the actual report that gives you all of the details. And again, all of that is extremely customizable. Um, so uh, that's that's a, a kind of a brief um, show off of our dashboards. Uh, we're able to do um, a lot of uh, management of our cases, our donors. Um, we even now track our uh, laptops that are uh, being borrowed 
by employees and taken off premises. So we we do some of that. Um, uh, what else was I going to show off here, Rick? Um, so we have um, a number, of, like I said, a number of dashboards, uh, all of our campaign information. So if we talk about um, some of our donor management, we're able to see, you know, pledges, payments, credit card payments, recurring donations. Um, and again, once this is all set up, we, we really have automated a lot of this. So payments that um, go through our website come directly into Salesforce. Uh, they first try to match up the donor with a current donor um, in the database. And if not, then they're put in as a new um, a new contact and um, we're able to track things and um, keep things up to date without really any staff effort. And, and, and as you see some of this, a lot of this has come as necessity um, just because of our small staff. Uh, we've been able to do a lot more uh, leveraging a platform that gives us the ability to customize and automate. Um, and I think, uh, I think Rick, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you were going to show some of the actual interface of the uh, pro bono side of the, what the, what the pro bono attorney volunteers are actually seeing. That's right, that I can share that. that. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, so this is, I guess in a nutshell, this is what it looks like. Um, all of these tabs at the top are customizable. You can swap out, change what objects you want to see up there. And you can do that by user. So we have uh, on the user level, um, we have user groups and we have specific users that only need to see certain aspects of the organization. Um, and, you know, there's there's all sorts of permission sets you can build around um, user access. So uh, it's, it's really uh, uh, highly customizable. I'll leave it there unless somebody has some questions or, or somebody would like to see something specifically. So a quick question on um, kind of uh, security and on uh, data destruction. Um, is, mm -hmm. um, is there the ability to uh, remove cases or remove files or things like that upon a client's request or um, if data has aged out, if, you, if you've had it for years and it's no longer relevant? Absolutely. Um, yeah, there are there are uh, a number of automatic purging. Um, we keep we keep data in here. Uh, I want to say we keep ten years, even though we're only required to keep seven. Um, but we yeah. So there's an automatic um, purging that can be set up, or everything can be kept. We we're not even close to running out of any sort of storage. Um, security wise, everything is. Um, two-factor authentication. We have all of our um, users use two-factor for the sole purpose um, of security. Although we do have a number of uh, employees, I shouldn't say number, we have a couple employees who don't have a cell phone. And so we have we have their uh, ability IP, IP address restricted, so they can only sign in to Salesforce from uh, our IP address or um, an IP address that we have given access to. So um, there are a lot of a, a lot of great security features like that. Excellent. That the two-factor yeah. authentication should really be a standard across the field, and this is one of the only case management systems I know that uh, that has that uh, fully implemented. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, and and their um, and their two-factor authentication uses. Um, uh, it is not like here we're going to text you a code, though they do have that option to set up. They use an authenticator app, um, which is a bit more secure than the text code. So um, it's it's really great. Um, and like I said, uh, there are a few workarounds if you don't want to use that, like the, the, IP, the IP address lock. So, um, yeah, we even, found it to be phenomenal. You can even restrict based on uh, times of day that they can log in. Yeah. And, and yeah. Um, you know, you can create flows for if they you know, need to log in after hours that they have restricted permissions at that point. Um, it, there's just infinite flexibility around that. 
yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's been wonderful. Excellent. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Brian, did you want to make me presenter? Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to walk through uh, some of the the workflow here. Um, so starting with intake, we have a, a wizard that will walk you through, and you can kind of configure which steps would be relevant to you. But um, the idea is this is something that somebody doing intake on a on a phone they could step through these. Uh, these pieces in this first screen uh, would get the high level details. So, you know, whatever key uh, contact information you want. And, and this is also the information that would go into um, conflict check, uh, categorizing, you know, the, the problem code. So, you know, if they're calling about an issue that you don't even support, then, you know, that they could be immediately disqualified then, or they're, they're in an area that you don't serve um, at any of these steps, we could immediately reject for those reasons. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in a bit. Um, and then we can enter any adverse or related, those could be people or organizations, we could add as many or as few of those as we want. Um, this will all go into conflict check. Um, and what we've done is tied into Salesforce has um, the ability to set your own matching and duplicate rules. Uh, and this will tie into that so that you can control what you want to consider uh, in, in the conflict check. So, you know, you can make it more broad if you have a smaller database or more specific if you want. Um, but it's going to come back um, and then you configure, you know, what, what fields do you see in the results here? Um, as well as it will return what match types there are. So there's, there's a list of things that it could be um, a client if they have a case, they could be an adverse, they could be a family member, they could, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a whole list of match types that could return here. And then we can see in cases, uh, instances where there's a case, we can also configure uh, fields from that case to be visible. Um, and then this being, browser-based, you can also you know, open these things up in, in a different tab or, you know, I hover over, I can see additional information as well. Um, so this has kind of two purposes here. Uh, it, it may be that there's a conflict. It may also be that it just, just is the same person. And so I don't want to create a duplicate. I want to use the person who's already in the system. So I can mark that, yeah, that's the same person and uh, no, there's not a conflict. Now, yeah, this always happens in a demo, doesn't it? So the next step, let me jump into another record. The next step is uh, citizenship, which is relevant uh, usually just for LSC funded organizations. Um, and we can configure uh, the different, uh, so, you know, they could be a U.S. citizen or they can be an eligible non-citizen and we can record what uh, information is required. All right, I'll just start here. Okay, so you know if you're not LSE funded, you can skip this screen entirely, um, and then you know you can choose based on these eligibility categories uh, if there's certain documentation that is required. So in the case of U.S. citizen, if we need to receive uh, citizenship 
attestation, then we can mark that's our qualifying document. And has it been verified by who? You know, what, what document number? If there's any comments to some qualifying uh, categories might require that you type in an explanation, you can do that. Uh, if there's a physical document you want to attach here, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and you know, Salesforce has the ability to do validation rules as well. So uh, you know, we're doing an, an implementa implementation where we ask, you know, is this a phone intake or an in-person intake? And then based on that, we can require that it be verified if it's in person and um, you know, th throw an error if not, or different things like that if we want to make sure that certain scenarios have been hit. Um, the next step is the... Okay, we've, we've got a few quick questions here. Um, one of them is um, with regards to client um, files, can you upload documents there and if so, when they're uploaded, do clients have a secure way to access it or is it just the attorney of record? Good question. So right now we just have the attorney uh, portal. Um, you could do you could do a portal for um, clients. We haven't created anything specifically for that right now. Um, we've done a lot of you know the the one way push where it's like an intake form. They could attach a document to push it in. Um, but uh, yeah, the 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 attorneys can definitely access any notes and documents that you attach. Uh, nothing specific for the client yet. Okay, so it is possible to build that out, but it is not um, in the core feature set that you're using. That's right. Okay. Okay, on the uh, important dates, so, um, some people want to specifically require that you think about this and say yes or no, and some people take this off and doesn't care, but uh, you can put in, you know, there may be an upcoming hearing or something that would impact uh, the time frame in which you need to respond to a case. Uh, but the financial piece is what's relevant to pretty much everybody. Um, so I can put in different sources of income here. And it will total that up into annual amounts and tell me where that puts them within the poverty level. And then as I change how many household members, that would also impact the poverty calculation here. So you can configure, and obviously those uh, numbers change every year, so that can be um, adjusted for the latest uh, poverty calculation. Um, you can also indicate like what your cutoff is. So it's not automatically qualifying. It's giving you the in information here to know, okay, based on what you've put in so far, it looks like they're qualified. Um, you know, there may be scenarios where even when they're slightly over, you might still be able to proceed. Um, you see, we got sections, you could add some additional help text, but uh, you know, if you've got someone who is a little bit over and you want to put in deductions then you'll end up with um, poverty level with and without those deductions um, assets uh, you can also set the asset limit and um, an additional amount for that asset limit per uh, household member, um, and this can be this can be required and be preloaded here. So if I want to make sure we ask about you know, any cash assets, then uh, it will tell me where I'm at as a percentage of my organization's asset limit, uh, or if it's tested by government means, then you know you don't need the details. So those are those steps are part of the the Justice Server wizard, and now we're looking at a kind of a standard Salesforce layout. So based on the information that you enter, often there might be different follow-up questions that are required based on the type of case that it is. 
Um, and, and you can kind of tailor to your preference what you want the layout to look like. So there's all sorts of useful things in Salesforce, like you know, on the side here, I can, I can go log a call or um, add a task if I want to assign somebody to follow up and get missing documentation or whatever that might be. I can, I can manage that within Salesforce or um, you know, any notes that I put in. That's going to go into the activity history here. So if you've got multiple individuals working on this, they can go back to kind of see a bit of a history of what's happened so far. Uh, there's even the ability to do kind of some branching logic through, like if you wanted to create a call script, uh, then you could set up in the back end. It's, it's kind of like creating a flow chart where you would walk them through a, a series of questions and uh, based on your answers, it would prevent present different information. Um, so there's not much to this one, but just an example that you, these could be any questions and it could have as many branches as, as you want to have there. Um, and it could be questions or it could be text. So if you want to guide the person on the phone to say, okay, if it's this type of case, please read this off to them and so forth. Um, on the intake record, um, at this point, we, we're we still trying to qualify this individual. So the terminology here, um, people call this different things. So this tab could be eligibility, screening, intake, uh, lead, what, whatever you want to call it. Um, at this point, we're trying to determine, can we help this person or not? So we're going to either go down a road of accepting or rejecting. So let me just show you the reject first. So if we reject, and on that wizard at any step, if I had hit reject, it would immediately take me to the screen. Um, I would say why, so you know, maybe they're outside our service area but I was able to refer them to some other provider or one or more providers. I can record those referrals. Uh, some people also have other services that they like to record here. Uh, if you wanna split out um, you know, brief advice or you invited them to a workshop or, or something, uh, that could be configured here as well. Um, and I see a question, the price of MPSP and the price of Justice Server. So the nonprofit success pack is available free. Um, you can go out and you can sign up for a trial um, and take a look at that. Uh, you might, you may or may not need assistance from a consultant to help set that up. So TechBridge, we have a standard process that we work through where we look at, you know, it's, it's a six week process each week looking at a different area like um, grants, donations, contacts. Um, and it's a combination of training and looking, making sure you know all the functionality that's there and some tweaks that you would want, you know, putting together your acknowledgements. Uh, Justice Server ranges, um, so if, everything out of the box worked for you. Um, you know, we do have some standard pricing around that. Typically there's, um, you know, everybody's process is a little different. We might go through like a, a small requirements to give you uh, exact pricing, what you want. And we, we could, you know, we could talk to you about all of that. Uh, something that we didn't demonstrate. Yeah. So, um, as as, um, as as mentioned, we this is something that's kind of grown out of requests from the legal service organization community. Um, and if there's something that's not available now, so for example, the client portal, uh, we could work with you to figure out what it would take to build that out. And then if that gets built out and included, um, then that becomes available for current justice server clients or future clients to take advantage of that as well. So everything that, that we're charging is, is for our, just for our time to, to build things out. 
Um, so first I'm going to unmute Brian here um, so that he can add anything that he's got there. And we've also got an additional question, um, which is um, if you do a note um, and there's an important upcoming date, does that create some type of a flag or an alert um, for the attorney when they get the case? And as a follow-up to that, someone else has a, had a question about um, tax message integration and getting notifications out to clients. Is that something that's currently available or possible? It is. There's a number of text message integrations. Um, Twilio has a good one. Um, so we don't, we haven't built something custom into Justice Server because there's a number of them already out there. So we would, you know, use one of those that works best for you. So for example, with Twilio, uh, you, you would pay based on the number of messages that you're sending out. So that could be configured that, um, you know, if you want to send them their referral details or the dates they've been scheduled for a clinic or anything, then you could send that out by SMS. Um, the important dates are definitely visible to the attorney. Um, and that could be, yeah, it could also be highlighted in a number of ways so that uh, there could be a reminder a certain number of days before that. It goes by email or uh, if you know you just want to highlight it visually, um, there's, those are things Salesforce is flexible on. Yeah, we, we've done some creative things here around that too. Uh, like we, we use Google Voice um, and for, for all of our text messaging. And so our, our advocates have created Google Voice numbers um, and anyone who's used that knows that integrates right into uh, a Google Mail account. And then we have that uh, integrated directly into our Salesforce. And the, the Google integration has no additional cost. So um, it, I, I can actually show off a, a screen showing this if, um, if you want to pass the presenter sure. to the screen. Um, so here you're seeing uh, me as a client in our system. Um, we have we have some some other um, alerts built in. You know you're seeing here the um, we have a client over the asset limit. So when they're over the limit, this auto pops up. So if somebody is searching for this client, and as soon as they come up, they're seeing that alert. Um, we have other things like that built in. Um, but you're seeing over here on the right under tasks some emails. Um, we have a company-wide email address that's through a Google Mail account that um, people, any one of our advocates can send emails to a client um, and the, both the sent and received messages are showing up as part of this client's record. So you'll also see them like in the um, email history here. You'll see who it's who it's actually from, even though it was a um, uh, advocate using our company-wide email address. You'll be able to see who did that in the Salesforce system. So um, it's it's really it's really powerful in that way. Um, we use that a lot. So, and because this was me, you probably saw some emails from Sart or whoever whoever else has sent me <laughs> an email lately. So, um, but I, I, I put this in just today, so as a, me as a client record, so that you could kind of get an idea of um, some of the, the ease of integration here. So and another two questions on the integration. Um, one of those is, <clears throat> is there integration with um, Office 365 uh, calendaring and Outlook or with Google calendars? There absolutely is, yeah. So you have the option um, in the in the main two integrations here are with Google Apps and and with Office 365 and um, and Outlook, and you can do Outlook Calendar or Google Calendar, yeah. And then here's a here's a more difficult one. Um, how does um, email integration work um, if you've got a client that has multiple cases? Um, does that email show up on all cases, or what what happens there? So, um, so right now we have it set up so that all of the correspondence with the client is 
part of the client record, all of the cases for the client are in a related list for that client. Now you can put um, emails specific to a case in the case record. Um, we haven't had the need for that, but it can be set up that way. So, um, so your task and email list here, um, you'd be able to um, have that attached to the case. We've only attached it to the client record and then pertinent information will throw into the case notes. Um, but the communication back and forth is, is in our client record. And like I said, that can, that can go either or both ways. Um, so currently you could manually attach it over to a case instead of to a client record. Um, if the case number or some other identifier was in the subject line, could that be automatically forwarded over or? There is a. Yeah, I believe you can do that, yeah. Yeah, there, there is an identifier. So like if you originate an email from Salesforce, like Brian's showing here, um, it would include that identifier. So if it's. Uh, you know, if it's configured so they respond to an email connected with Salesforce, it would automatically go back into this case. Um, the 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 app oh, okay. that that lives in Outlook or Gmail as well um, sits on the side and it goes to try to find a match based on you know the name and email. So it, it would return any any matches. So you could just manually click to record that email, you know, directly to the contact or directly to the case, you'd see a list of any cases that that person has. Okay, so you can put a unique identifier in the email that if somebody responds to that and that is in the text, then it would reattach to that case? Is that what you're saying? That's right, yeah. yeah. There's also a generic email you can use that kind of forwards everything into a holding place in Salesforce that you can then go back from within Salesforce and drag them over to the right case from there. Okay. Yeah, Brian's definitely the uh, Google integration king. So anybody who's doing anything with Google, Brian's the guy. Um, there was a question, could you go over um, keeping time and how that works, um, what that functionality looks like. Sure. Uh, let's see, Brian, do you want to pass it back to me? Okay, so we, we were on the last step to get to a, a case record. So just real quick, um, the accept client does another check to see uh, if there's any matches. So I could either do this as a new client or reopen an existing case. Uh, the time records, uh, you can keep your time against the case or it can, you know, we can see we've got a tab up here for hours. So they, they don't necessarily have to be associated with a case. Um, so in, in here, you know, if you have ways that you want to categorize, um, you can configure that even you know, with subcategories as well. Uh, and that could be either with a certain number of hours or the start and end times. Uh, it's there are hourly rates as well, so you could have like a system default for what the the rate would be, and then it would um, pick that up at the at the user level, and you could override that to say some attorneys bill at different rates, uh, or you know even at the task level as you're recording, you could override that to not that you're billing you know, if it's pro bono, but so that you can show like the equivalent value that was provided. Um, on the case, there's a couple of ways um, you can, you know, you can originate an hours record here and it would be pre-populated with the case or there there is a, a stopwatch function as well. So when you start and stop the time that it um, records that against the case and asks you, a couple of follow-up questions. 
uh, when I get to the volunteer portal, they, they have the same ability to log their time or to, to use a stopwatch here. Um, so yeah, that's one of the core things once you once we get to the case record here is the the time management as well as you know going in and, and adding notes. So the notes function in Salesforce will open up in the corner here so you can continue to browse and keep your notes. And then when you save it, it goes into that list. Um, so it's going to automatically be associated with the case and um, you, know, you can do rich text. Um, you can see the, the history of the, the notes that have been added. Um, you might also have additional people on the on the case. So there's the case team here would show, um, you know, if you want to indicate who was the uh, the supervisor or who there's a intake worker or there's um, the the pro bono worker. The various people could be listed in here. Um, you know, we've got the, the client. So, so you, you've got a separation between there's a, a contact record and the case record. So one, one client could be a repeat uh, to have multiple cases, uh, whereas, you know, I know in a lot of systems, uh, you end up with kind of duplicates because there's not really a separation there, um, as well as uh, the household. So there could be additional contacts within the household if you need to record uh, their children or spouse or whatever it might be in, in, in the household. Um, all those financial records that we may have entered that or, or any notes at the intake, all of that transfers over and is available at the case record as well. Um, and then you know you can put in various case outcomes. Um, so you know we've got a close screen that kind of lets you bring that all into focus to say uh, what was the outcome. So, you know, these are just some common ones that we might put in here, but you, you might have some additional things that grants require you to track and those fields could be indicated as well as uh, having these other benefits that were provided. So it could be something that is, uh, can be quantified monetarily and you know there was a judgment of a certain amount it was one time or it was it's a monthly amount um, or non-monetary outcomes just you know how many times did we uh, resolve a credit reporting error um, there could be multiple things and you can record these as you go as well it doesn't have to be only at the the closed screen but this you know reminds you to collect all of this information at the end here Uh, the other thing I want to show is the, the portal aspect. So we've got, uh, this is a sandbox version of, of the Justice Server portal. So I mean, if you go to justiceserver.org, you'd see something that looks like this. Uh, I'm not logged in here. So if I go look at uh, the case listing, it would just be super high level uh, type of case location. And uh, there's a, a public description that people can enter that wouldn't have any identifiable information. As soon as I try to go any farther, I have to be logged in. I have to be approved with that organization. And I have to proceed through conflict check to get anything more. Uh, but they, they can filter. So if they're interested in cases in a particular area or a particular type of case, um, they can filter that down. Um, they can even save. Uh, reminders so that um, if a case is added that meets certain criteria that they would they would get a notice of that so once I log in as an attorney then I have uh, I have my dashboard so I've got a bunch of cases in here already but if I go back uh, and, and the way that these would get to the portal, uh, the case can be pushed from Salesforce. So you, you probably have someone who would be in charge of making sure that the information is ready, that there's a, 
uh, appropriate description and the you know, the key, the problem code, the location information is there, and then you can push it out to the portal. Um, you, you can also configure some defaults. So based on the problem code, there might be just a default description that pastes into there, and you can kind of start from that. Um, so it, it could either be pushed to that listing, or it could be assigned to a particular volunteer, um, and it becomes you know a private case. It doesn't. It's not listed, but the attorney can get to it through the pro bono portal. So when I express interest, um, there's a time limit that it's going to be taken off of the list. So it gives me time to do the conflict check before it would return back to the listing. And each organization gets to choose how long that would be. Um, and at this point, they would get the name and contact for anyone. And I didn't really put enough information in here. There would normally be an address. And um, so you know, I've got the client. And then any, you know, here I had a, an adverse party that I entered. So if there was a name and a contact, or if I had indicated what the relationship to the client was, it would, it would list that information here. Um, so you know, this is another, the, the next step. Uh, I'd either say no conflict or uh, you know reject or I'm, I'm not interested but if I do not have a conflict um, then it would go on to uh, to pending acceptance and from pending acceptance uh, into your your active cases let's see So the at this point um, they're redirected to that uh, local version of the portal that I mentioned. So that through single sign-on, uh, it's redirected, and and then you can kind of control the um, information that they see at this point. So based on the type of case that it is, you can set which fields that they would see here, uh, and you can have some fields read only, some fields editable. Uh, if there were any case notes here, then they can see those notes or they can come in and add their own notes, attach their own files. That information is visible to uh, within Salesforce as well, anything that the, the volunteer enters in. Uh, they can see the case team. So if um, you know it's possible, you could have multiple volunteers, or um, if they need to see you know, who the the lead staff attorney is, so that they can you know, interface with that person. They could see that here. Uh, any related parties, any financial information, uh, the important dates. Or if they're aware of a date, then they can they can go and add that information in. Uh, hours, just like we looked at, so they have a stopwatch as well, um, or they can you know, just add their hours. Um, the the hours would sync for the uh, the volunteer as well so if they're working across multiple cases even multiple organizations then they would see a roll up of how many volunteer hours that they have uh, contributed uh, there could be resources so based on the type of ish, um, type of case again uh, links or sample documents or things that might be useful to them could be provided here uh, there's a there's a built-in stale case function so um, we can configure that if we say if, if it's been two weeks and we haven't heard anything no updates no notes uh, send an email reminder to the volunteer and that would prompt them to either do like a one button click that says nope everything's good remind me again in a week uh, or click through to access the screen and, and enter their 
their information. Uh, when they finish, then they have their own kind of closing screen as well. Um, so you know they would indicate why they're closing it. They can give any comments. Um, you can configure so. Each organization kind of has a different preference usually on this as to whether this is kept very brief um, and then the staff follows up or, or you, you get as much information as possible from the volunteer. So you know, here they're seeing the same outcome fields and the ability to, to put in these benefits, but this could be hidden and just kept to the, the comments. Um, when a case closes, uh, the, the lead staff person would be notified. Um, the case would be flagged so that they can confirm that it is, in fact, completed, and, and then you can close that out. Um, so, you know, here you can see the different statuses. This is stuff that you would customize. So, you know, whatever statuses are uh, you, you need to work through, so that's things you can report on or build triggers on. Um, I'll stop. Any other questions at this point? Um, uh, have you done migration from other um, platforms out, outside of it? Sounds like this one was done from time, right? Um, we have. We've looked at time. Um, we've looked at camps and PICA, um, a lot of times just people working in spreadsheets. And, um, so yeah, we, we definitely do data migrations as well. Okay, is, is Legal Server one of those that you've done? We've worked um, with doing some integration with Legal Server. Um, I, I'm not sure if we've migrated anybody off of Legal Server yet, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we you can import data. So as long as you can dump it out into spreadsheets or whatever, you, you can um, you can get that data migrated into Salesforce. Okay. Um, and are there easy ways to add additional fields? Yeah, and actually, let me just be of interest to see kind of what the back end looks like. So this is, you know, again, one of the benefits to Salesforce is that you know, they like to talk about clicks, not code. Um, now, you know, you've got to learn where to go and it can get as deep as you want, but at the basic level, doing things like adding fields or changing layouts, uh, it, you don't have to be technical, um, you just have to have the rights to come in here and do this and, and you can make modifications. So I'm looking at a case object here and I can see all the fields that are on the case. So if I took um, something that was like a pick list field, then I can go see what the current options are and uh, you know go add a new option or remove or, or edit those. Um, I could add in, create new fields, and it'll just step me through. Um, and then on my layouts, it's just a visual uh, drag and drop to move things around or take fields on, take them off, make them required. You know, I can just drag things around here on the page layout. Um, the report builder is the other uh, item that's probably of interest. And I, I should just say while he's pulling that up, the reporting is phenomenal and building reports is so easy. We have a lot of our staff that like, you know, they just, they want to see a report on something so they create it and um, it's really a drag and drop situation. And, I'm sure Rick's about to show here. So this is going to start just kind of looking like a, a spreadsheet. I'm reporting on cases. So 
I could uh, I could group things. So maybe I want to know based on problem code. And then if I have any fields that are dollar amounts or numbers or um, like let's say total hours, Well, Ruth, does that, I'll mention that um, here at TechBridge, we will use um, reporting and send out, for example, you know, if we bring in uh, new projects in a week, we will have an automatic email that notifies us all of that so that at our Monday morning meeting, we can talk about those without anyone having to go in and do the manual work to get it to us. So I see that as certainly a benefit if you're trying to um, do discussions about new casework or, or whatever the item may be. Maybe it's old casework. <laughs> yeah, so I can, I can just take this and, and easily create a grouping, summarize, make a chart out of that. Uh, I can change what, what fields I see here. And then, um, yeah, say, save that. You know, Brian showed all the dashboards that they have. Um, you can, you know, export this if you want to manipulate it further. Um, you can, you can even subscribe to these. So, if you want to see case statuses come to you every Monday morning, then then you can set that up. Um, and it can get more advanced for you know building filters or uh, buckets like um, you know every grant wants you to report different age groups or different categories of of um, ethnicity breakdown so you know you can take your um, date of birth and have it group and say okay for this report I want to group you know 18 to 25 but in this other one I want you know 20 to 30. Right, right. The other really neat thing, um, and so they they um, they update Salesforce like f regularly four times a year. Um, and one of the new features that came out in the summer release was um, line level uh, um, formulas on reports. So you can you can run formulas right within Salesforce um, on the reports. So if you want to see like the date case closed minus the date the case opened, how many days each of the cases were open it can do that formula right within the report without creating a new field and then you know uh, um, you can always make a, a field that is a formula field as well but it's really handy having that that ability within reports um, and then i can i can go in and hide so if i just i don't want to see all the the detail i just want to see a, a total then you know i hide that and i see here okay for each problem code here's exactly how many cases i have and how many hours that have been worked on those so here's another one back on the security side of things um, so are you able to limit fields and cases um, to specific users or user groups yeah, there's a there's a lot of flexibility on permissions. So it can be field level, object level. Um, so maybe I can see contacts, but not cases. Um, it can be record level. So um, I can maybe only see my own cases, uh, or you know everything could be hidden by default. So for example, with the way that we handle the the volunteers everything is hidden from them by default and then specific rules will share it back to them so if they have been assigned to a case that specific case would be assigned to them if you wanted you know a team that worked with a particular type of case then if it had that type it could be shared with them 
Um, and, and yeah, there's definitely um, profiles. People could be grouped into different profiles uh, that have base permissions um, or, you know, groupings of permission sets so that, you know, maybe I, I hold role A and role B, so I assign both of those, but I don't have role C. Um, there is a there is an API natively for Salesforce as well, um, and we've got an API to the pro bono portal. So, for example, in uh, in Virginia, um, Kemp's has an integration. So, um, you know, they they have a, a statewide mandate in Virginia to to try to collaborate more. So, uh, Justice Server and Kemp's organizations are able to use the same. Justice Server Pro Bono portal um, with uh, uh, the Health Consumer Alliance in California. Um, they are needing to, you know, there's about 10 organizations that need to share outcomes on health related matters. And so they're um, using Justice Server to uh, report those health related items. So with, with an API, uh, the health cases can be submitted and, and then there's a, a data warehouse to roll up across the organizations, anonymized the, the data across those organizations or um, you know, we're about to, to launch with another uh, eviction group in California so that instead of referrals between um, organization to pro bono attorney, it's gonna be referral between, between organizations um, and a, an algorithm that uh, allows them to uh, enter like what their qualifications are, but then also um, rank. So it, it runs the algorithm and, and ranks where a particular case should go. Yeah, and I, I should actually add to that that um, we are working uh, slowly, but we're working on using the API integration to uh, collaborate with our partners here, inner building and exchange information seamlessly with legal server. So if we're taking a, a a pause on um, other questions. I'd like to throw one out from myself, Samantha, to Brian. Um, Brian, how did you um, become such an expert in uh, Salesforce and Justice Server? Was it, you know, previous experience that did it for you? Did you just find it easy to navigate in? What um, made it so easy for you to become sort of the champion of the project and then help it move forward? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm actually going to blame uh, Rick for most of this because um, going through the uh, migration process uh, with Rick, I, before before that I had zero experience in Salesforce, and so getting up to speed and navigating it um, started there. Uh, and then it was really just joining some of the online communities that are available. There's a Salesforce community called Power of Us. Um, asking questions, uh, you get responses from hundreds of different people uh, in that uh, online forum. And uh, and then I, I work, uh, I actually have three different Salesforce instances that I'm using now. So I do some work for another local nonprofit and then we run a small nonprofit that uses it. So um, I'm, I've kind of become immersed in it uh, every day and um, and, and really, it's something that anybody could pick up and dive pretty deep into pretty easily. Yeah, thanks for that. And if you listening don't maybe feel as um, like you're ever going to be as deep a diver as Brian is, um, TechBridge does offer um, buckets of support once uh, our products are uh, deployed. So it may be something where you have a Brian and they can do, you know, 90% of what you need, but uh, you have had experience and you said, oh, you know what, if we had this 
um, report that is a little more challenging or if we had this item running that we don't know how to do, then um, TechBridge actually does buckets of 10 hours used in 15 minute increments where uh, you could have us go in and, and make that change or that fix for you. So um, the options there, you're not once this goes out, you're not one and done with it, but you have the ability to, to keep us involved in helping as needed. Excellent. So we're down to about five minutes here. If anybody else from the audience has questions, uh, please let us know. Um, as we get close to um, wrap up, what is uh, the best way to uh, contact or to to follow up for information about um, about uh, all of the things that we've looked at here today? Absolutely. So at the end of our presentation, we have our um, email addresses that we're able to feel free to contact any of us, um, you know, ask Brian about how he got so skilled, um, ask me about how to get started with Justice Server or um, what other things TechBridge might be able to do for you. An example is that um, besides Justice Server, TechBridge has also started really doing um, comprehensive technology assessments within legal service organizations. And um, we've actually been working closely with LLC to sort of make sure that legal service organizations are sort of meeting their standards. So if you're LLC funded, for example, um, feel free to reach out to me about, you know, engaging in one of those assessments or any of the products that you saw earlier today. I'm happy to, to tell you how we can um, make those beneficial for legal. And then, of course, if you have um, more justice server questions, Rick Rose is the man, as Brian said. He can um, certainly get you down to those minute details and um, also engage in another demo just for you to maybe address uh, the things about your program that you would be interested in hearing about. So um, please feel free to email us at any of the things you see on screen there. Um, with with regards to the uh, kind of um, tech assessment and getting organizations up to um, where they um, need to be, especially with regards to security, safety, case management systems, that type of stuff, um, we would be happy to host a future webinar or something else kind of directed at kind of the basics of that. Um, as I know, a lot of the organizations that we uh, deal with have very limited in-house tech staff and aren't aware of what kind of pieces they're missing, especially beyond the LSC kind of baselines. So that is definitely a great resource. Yeah, absolutely. One program that we don't end up talking about as much, but TechBridge loves to offer it, is a CIO on-demand program. So um, exactly addressing what you're talking about, um, start, we can go in and not only address your current situation, but also give recommendations on where you can be going. And that may or may not, you know, include where Justice Server fits. But um, regardless, what it does is allow you to have that, you know, high level executive thinking about not only your current state, but your future state, um, helping with things like writing job descriptions or um, planning out your move from an on-site server to the cloud, whatever it is. And um, you get that person, you know, just for the hour, not for the annual salary plus benefits. So um, that's a program we love to engage with our comprehensive assessment uh, because not only, again, your current state, but, you know, let's get you set up for the future as well. <laughs> 